Okay, so this week we're going to talk about App ID, which is our application identity. Um, we've talked a couple different ways of monitoring attacks, um, particularly trying to monitor traffic and the types of traffic that can come through there. So with App ID, um, what we're going to do is be able to determine the exact application that's coming through the firewall. So we've talked about just being port based in the past, where if it's port, say, 80, then we assume it's web traffic, but we don't know whether that user is accessing Gmail, Google Docs, Google Calendar, Zoom, etc. So we are going to be able to specify that or be able to determine what that traffic is with App ID. And so in the definition of a Palo Alto firewall, an application is a specific program or feature whose communication can be labeled, monitored, and controlled. So what is App ID? Well, if we take a look at our objects and our applications, we can take a look at all the different applications that we have identified. This is one of those that constantly gets updated on a Palo Alto firewall. So we talked about doing updates and such. This is one that updates almost daily. With App ID, it identifies applications in the traffic that's been observed by the firewall. So for example, traffic comes in, is it identified by any kind of application signature? If yes, then we can take action based on a security or even a decryption policy. Um, if we have a decrypt SSL turned on, then we can send that back out and go through. Um, if it does not get identified, then can we identify it by a known protocol decoder? If yes, then it goes down. If no, then it goes on for behavioral heuristics. And then we go ahead and go as, um, and identify it as un uh, unknown traffic. So multiple ways to decode a particular application. Do we have a known signature? Do we have a protocol that we can decode? Or um, is it behaving like such and such application that we can classify it as that? If not, we classify it as unknown. All right, so the difference between port-based and next-generation firewalls like a Palo Alto, um, if we have a firewall rule that allows port 53, typically for what? Does anybody remember what port 53 usually is? I'll give you a hint. If it's on the slide, it's DNS, right? So typically, if we need to allow DNS traffic outbound, then we need to allow port 53. The packet comes in on 53, comes into the DNS, gets allowed on through. However, when we do this in a Palo Alto firewall, if DNS traffic comes in, we allow DNS traffic out. However, if BitTorrent is assigned to port 53 because that's what's open in the firewall, then it will allow BitTorrent traffic to go through, whereas in a Palo Alto firewall, it will deny that traffic. We can detect that that's BitTorrent traffic going across that port and just block it. So we're not blocking based on ports, we're blocking based on the type of traffic going through. Now, it is possible with an old school firewall that you would have a firewall that would allow that traffic through, but then you have an intrusion prevention system that's able to then identify what type of traffic is going through the network and then it can kill it at that point. So um, if there was any kind of zero day come through here, again, it's gonna allow it. Because that IPS does not have any kind of signature for a zero day, it's gonna end up allowing that traffic through. There again, on a Palo Alto firewall, we're gonna immediately deny that alternate new zero day traffic because it does not make the signature for DNS. Now, obviously there's still ways to get around this where we can encode traffic that looks specifically like DNS requests um, using the payload of the DNS in order to transmit it through much harder for it to get detected and, and blocked, um, but it's not impossible for it to, uh, to get through. So when we're dealing with uh, App ID and TCP, as we know with the TCP, we have the three-way handshake. So we send off a SYN packet, which has our source destination addresses, as well as our source and destination ports. We send that to the server. That server then sends a SYN packet back to the client, as well as an acknowledgement then the client will send back the acknowledgement along with a request of what they are looking to get. So when we classify TCP traffic, we have non-applicable, incomplete, insufficient data, unknown TCP, and unknown peer-to-peer. -peer. 
And we can see how that traffic goes through just in the same fashion. If we get through a uh, SIN ACK, then we consider that to be incomplete. At that point, the three-way handshake did not complete or was not completely followed by any kind of data. At the point we send data, we can then classify that as insufficient data for the PILO type that goes through. Once we acknowledge that and the data again, at this point, we may be able to determine the application name or it is classified as unknown TCP or peer-to-peer -peer type traffic. When it comes to UDP, remember that we're not doing that three-way handshake, so we're just blasting out the traffic. So the first UDP packet comes through with that source and destination address. We also have the source and destination port, and we start sending the application data. Um, for labeling UDP traffic, we either have it as non-applicable, the data comes in, we just drop the traffic based on our policy, or we have the option of either identifying that application or labeling it as unknown UDP or unknown peer-to-peer. -peer. You guys have any questions so far on app ID? All right. So applications within network and such can shift between one application and up to another session. So normally we start with, say, going to our Gmail, but then we move from our Gmail to use Google Chat. Um, and we shift from one application to the next. So this kind of demonstrates that where we come in based on normal web browsing, which we allow, we shift over to some generic app base, say, for example, Google. And then we shift from that over to the chat side. So how does that work? This is based on application dependencies. And so, for example, if we want to allow Joe to have access to Office 365, then what we have to do is have a required application that we have down here at the bottom, which is SSL and web browsing. We allow that traffic up to the point where they identify as Office 365, which is identified by the Office 365 base application, at which point they may go into the Office On Demand and or SharePoint at that point. Um, yes, we're still allowing all this traffic, but we're actually labeling this traffic different. We could protect ourselves even further and set up individual rules for Office 365. Um, so when you enable a particular application, it's going to have some dependencies at some point. For example, the Microsoft Office base is required to have SSL and web browsing available um, for filtering. If you have any missing dependencies, it's going to let you know down here at the bottom. For example, here requires SSL and web browsing. So we're going to go ahead and automatically add those when we enable the Office 365 base not something we have to do. It pretty much just counts its way up. Um, there are some implicit applications where many common applications implicitly allow parent applications. For example, here we're talking about Facebook, um, where Facebook base um, implicitly allows your web browsing and SSL. And so there's no need to add any kind of rule for them specifically. Those are implicit applications versus these other ones over here, which just have dependencies. All right. Notice over here when it, the difference is, is we no longer have it depends on, we have it on implicitly using, meaning that it's gonna immediately add a min. All right, so there's a bunch of applications out there and we can define our own groups. So instead of us having to go through and enable like Office 365 and Gmail and Twitter and a bunch of other ones, we can set up our own group and just classify it as say social engineering or social networking. So in this case, we have social networking, we're going to allow Twitter, Facebook and YouTube, or we could also set those to block those type of things if we wanted to block those specific ones. Um, but we can add all these different applications in here. You can also set up a filter. So if you go to objects tab over to applications filter and add, you can add the specific applications in there as a filter. These are useful for building dynamic groups. You can use them to select different filters and then simplify security, quality of uh, service and PBF or the uh, policy based forwarding policies within the firewall. Um, let's see. So if you look at our predefined and custom application tags, 
Um, for example, obviously the Palo Alto is going to have all the app IDs and you can assign one or more of those tags to different applications. So this may be known as enterprise VoIP and it may be a web app kind of thing. Those are the predefined tags. We can also create our own custom tags in there as well. Um, that can also be beneficial if we are running our own programs and they don't have app heuristics for that. So say you uh, create a web application that's meant for in-house, you can write a heuristic policy that, that matches that. There's a couple different ways to uh, block that. So like here, if we look at these different applications, we're gonna end up allowing those, but we also have the ability to use an application block page, which means for any of those applications that we deem that we don't want them to have access to, we can set up a particular block page. It looks like this over here in the upper right. And it basically states that you're trying to use something that's been blocked with a company policy. We can change that text, the language, we can edit this however we want. If we're looking in our traffic log, you'll notice that anything that is identified as a particular application will show up. So for example, if we're out browsing on Instagram, it's gonna show up on Instagram's base, Twitter, Google, et cetera. We can actually see that directly in the firewall. The whole goal is to reduce the number of illegitimate and unknown applications allowed by the firewall. In other words, we just want to allow the ones that we care about. Remember the best security is not to allow it and then block things later. It's better to block everything and only allow what we're going to allow. So with applications, it's not like the antitrust thing where like they'll just allow everything to open until we say it's eligible. No, it, will, it all depends on how your basic rule is set up. So if your basic rule is just to allow 80 and 443, then yeah, you're opening the, the world up. Where if you start locking down applications and saying, okay, we're no longer going to allow just 80 and 443. We're only going to allow Google Base and we're only going to allow that kind of stuff. So, for example, if a company's using something like Office 365, they may block Google um, so that employees are not trying to use Google services where their company is using a Office 365 setup. They're paying for Office 365. They want you to use that, not the Google Drive. Um, that can be a great way for companies to limit the footprint that they have within the company. So for example, here at Fort Hayes, right? We all have, as instructors, we have Office 365, but we are Office. And then we also have our Google accounts and we're not supposed to put any kind of student information or do any real business with our Google account. Just that's purely there for the old school default email. Um, but nobody does that, right? Because in most people's opinion, Google Drive is a whole lot easier to use than, than the Microsoft site. So um, this, if, if they turn this on, it would block the ability for us to even access Google. Therefore, you wouldn't have to worry about it being a thing. Which is also good for your cybersecurity insurance policies and all that. I had to do a bunch of training even this morning for another company, um, which is your standard security awareness training. But that can get pretty pricey pretty fast with a cybersecurity insurance policies lately. And the way they mitigate that cost is to make sure every employee goes through some form of training, even if it's the same one that you do every month. If it's in your head and they make you do it multiple times, then, uh, then you tend to remember and not allow bad things to happen, at least in theory. At least in theory. So differentiating between known and unknown applications, we allow some network traffic if it's identifiable by the app ID, for example, FTP, SMTP, and Facebook. If it's unidentifiable by the app ID, we determine whether or not it's running over HTTPS, meaning that it's a secured session, in which case we can identify that as SSL traffic. Um, if it is not HTTPS, then we can identify it as HTTP and we can allow that through web, web browsing standard. Um, if it's not detectable as either one of those, then we identify that as unknown TCP, UDP, or PTP. And we would have to check those traffic logs to see how much of that content is actually coming in. Once we see those uh, unknown applications in, the way that we control that is to create a custom application 
with a custom signature, which we can do through objects, applications, and add. We can create an application override policy, um, or we could just flat block that traffic that goes through there. Um, and this could end up blocking more traffic than intended if we did that in such a way. So one way of doing that is to block it, find out what your users can access. Is it legitimate traffic? Then allow it at that point. Um, that's, it depends on the size of your company as to whether or not you guys can follow that security practice, so to speak. There again, the more you block, the better off you are, the more protected you are, the cheaper your insurance policies are, all that kind of stuff. For control applications on SSL secure ports, so the application default, which we've seen there multiple times when we create uh, policies, that's basically going to match to clear text applications on standard ports, so things like FTP, uh, port 80, that kind of stuff. SSL encrypted applications are going to be matched to the secure ports, though so this would end up allowing things like web browsing, SMTP, FTP, LDAP, POP3, IMAP, etc. Malicious traffic will also often use non-standard application ports. It's not going to use your standard ones. Um, for example, 3306 is going to be your MySQL. If it runs off on something else, we may end up wanting to drop that. So if we look at these three rules, rule one is going to block all SSH um, tunnels, um, either on standard or non-standard ports. That way we cannot uh, have somebody come in with SSH. Um, rule, two, uh, rule, two, rule two is going to allow RDP traffic, but only on the standard ports. So we can't set up things like uh, Microsoft's remote desktop protocol on port 5000. We would have to use the standard port number for that. Pop quiz, anybody know the standard port for Microsoft RDP? Fletch, Jeffrey, do you guys happen to know? No. I was just for the semester, but that's okay. Leave, I'd have to quote myself, and I'm pretty sure it's 3389. Now that I brought it up, I have to go look it up. Three, three, eight, nine. I used to have all that stuff memorized because I did firewalls back when everything was just port based and you had to try to identify traffic on ports. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's a weird quirk. It, I memorized IP addresses, port numbers. That is one of my one and only uh, skill sets, I guess. All right. Identifying applications based on uh, decrypted SSL traffic. So when we go access Facebook over HTTPS, uh, that hits our Palo Alto firewall. We have to try to decrypt that traffic and identify what type of traffic is going across there. We will then allow it to go out to the web server and go out to Facebook and then come back. Um, obviously, we always look for that padlock at the top of our web browser, right? That in, ensures or at least tells us that we are currently on a SSL encrypted traffic directly to the web server. And we do that through cookies and we do that through web certificates, etc. If we put a Palo Alto in the front and we want to decrypt everybody's SSL traffic, right? Because if we just allow SSL traffic, then anybody can go do whatever they want. They just have to make sure they do it over some kind of SSL tunnel, right? Um, another way of doing that is like using a proxy server. So we could use some kind of SSL proxy server and us as clients, we can bypass any kind of firewall um, just by simply using SSL encryption. Kids at the high school do this stuff all the time. So how do we stop that in a Palo Alto? We actually decrypt all the SSL traffic going across there which means we play man in the middle, but in a good way um, where the firewall can identify and decrypt that SSL traffic and then app ID will use um, their application database in order to determine on that decrypted SSL traffic what it is based on signatures, decodes and behavioral heuristics. So the way that works is, is you typically go out to Twitter on the Palo Alto device, we have the certificate authority, which gives us the current certificate. We go out to the web server 
And this allows us a single website to use a, a unique IP address, right? So if I go to google.com, it usually translates to some kind of C name um, on that certificate and bring that back. You can also use the SNI field inside of TLS. This is gonna allow us to have multiple websites that share the same IP address. Um, and that's how we transmit that information back. We're gonna go much more in depth in decrypting SSL traffic here in a couple uh, modules um, where we actually play with that and turn that on and, and show how that actually works. All right, so again, if we start off with a simple port-based firewall and we're going to be uh, migrating, migrating that over to app-based ID rules, which is more progressive, that's gonna be your next generation stuff. This will help us again, reduce our attack surface. So we're not just blanket opening port 80 and we're gonna be able to provide some information about application usage. That also tells us where our users are going. Is that legitimate traffic, is it not? And it identifies the difference between something like Facebook and Google, et cetera. It also allows and prevents evasive applications from running on non-standard ports. So like we said, if we're running BitTorrent on something that say port 80, then we would identify it as BitTorrent traffic and not just allow it through. So in phase one, we identify the legacy port uh, policy rule. We add an application-based rule above the port-based rule corresponding to whatever that application is that we want to allow. In phase three, we go back and remove the port-based rule. So the way we do that is, is we add the application that we would assume be on that port-based. For example, if we're on port 3389, we are doing what application? Microsoft RDP. So we would actually set a RDP rule before that 3389 rule make sure that all the hits from there on out are actually getting hit to that application-based rule. Once they are no longer hitting the 3389 rule, we can go ahead and remove that port-based rule. So you can kind of see how this works. This is kind of a standard uh, tool for doing this. So uh, approximately a week, you migrate the port-based policy in the PanOS software over, you freeze the legacy policy. You cut over and test your migrated policy, monitor, resolve any user complaints for about a day. You log in user traffic and application traffic. And after about 30 days, you can start into phase two, which is adding this here. So first phase, we're gonna go through, set up a port-based policy inside our Palo Alto. We cut over to that migrated policy. We're gonna monitor and resolve any user complaints about that one day out. Uh, we're going to start logging all of our application traffic. 30 days out, we're going to start setting it up for specific applications. During phase two, you can see here, for example, we have a port-based one. So we're going to allow FTP and HTTP. We're going to start setting that up where we allow any application. Down here, we can see because we're using application default, we're allowing all applications. We come out and take a look at our traffic by optimizing that particular policy. We'll see that four apps were identified in our port-based traffic. Um, we can go down and take a look and we see, okay, a good chunk of that is DNS, web browsing, syslog, FTP traffic, et cetera. You can adjust your time frame to take a look at how that's coming through. At that point, we're gonna go ahead and clone our existing rule um, using the create cloned rule. This is gonna create us an application-based one. We can specifically allow things like FTP in there based on a container. And when's the last time we saw that on that rule? So instead of you guys having to judge what's happening over port 80 traffic, you enable port 80 traffic, let it run for a couple of days. You start looking at the applications we're identifying. If that's the traffic you want, you can either allow that type of traffic or disallow it. Once you feel like after 30 days that you have everything set up, then you can move over to your application rules. Obviously, that's not a hard and fast time frame, but that's a, a good one as a basic recommendation. So as we look through here, we can see that the FTP application was removed based on the port rule um, and the app scene, and we must manually configure application default to allow that. All right, phase two comes along. We start setting up the port-based rule to end up allowing FTP. We specifically set that up so that our application and our service over here, um, we want to change our services back to the application default. 
And we are specifically looking at this application here and making sure that's just FTP. And that's replacing our port 80 that we're allowing. And we can see how it migrates through. So we have users to the extranet here. We're allowing FTP and HTTP. We've created a new policy down below it. Um, that one allows us to specifically do DNS, FTP, SSH, and SSL, which we did before. We set up and go back to the original application default. Over here on the left-hand side, when we're replacing that, uh, we can look at our uh, match usage and we can figure out how much we are using that particular policy and then it actually matches out. From there, you can prioritize port-based rules to convert. So uh, for example, if we come in here and look at this uh, policy optimizer, we can see you know, how many of these applications have found, how much traffic is going through there, and how many of those days with no new applications. So if we have that strict down, then we can see whether or not we're getting new ones or not. For example, here on the extranet going out to the internet, we can see that it's been six days with no new applications. We probably have that policy set up pretty well. In that last phase, we go through, we temporarily just disable those port base, make sure that no new traffic is getting breaked out or uh, getting lost, I should say, and then we can go ahead and remove that whole uh, port base. So we disable it temporarily. After 90 days, we go through and actually delete those rules that have not had any match traffic um, based on that. And the goal is to be at least 80% application-based rules as opposed to port-based and no inbound or outbound unknown applications um, are allowed. Anything internal to our program is acceptable. Meaning that if we have applications that are just locally on our system, we're okay with that. But we don't want anything going out to the internet that we're not able to identify. All right, as I mentioned in the content updates, um, the there's a applications and threat content update that always happens on the Palo Alto. This can be hourly, daily, um, that they send these out. That goes out to the app ID engine and the content ID engine. Um, that's where we set up our policies. And then you have this maximum protection list over here. So we constantly get these identifications coming in. Um, those app IDs can be identified by your firewall. And then what they are is later on identified by all the different systems if they assume that that's the new content. So say Microsoft starts using a different port, um, Palo Alto updates the port that would be registered for the base. You don't have to change anything in your policy. You just update your applications and threats. You can go through and inspect those each time if you wanna see what changes were made in those. And you can see how that is being changed every time. By default, you schedule those download and installs. Um, for example, your Dynamic updates for apps and threats happen every 30 minutes. We schedule an update at five minutes past the half hour. So it would be at 835, that kind of thing. Um, and we can tell it to either download and install those, or we could just download them and then where we have to manually install them. Um, you can disable any new apps. So if you don't want to allow new applications out of that update, you just want to update your existing ones, you can click that checkbox there and not allow new ones in there. Um, benefits to doing that is if you have a blanket group, for example, um, you use something like uh, social media, right? So earlier we created our own application group called social media, but Palo Alto has one that has a bunch of different things that are associated with Palo, uh, social media. If we enable the blanket social media and then some new application comes out, um, say TikTok for whatever reason, right? But we don't want to allow TikTok on our network then we would disable any new apps so that it wouldn't automatically start allowing the new applications to come in off those groups. Um, we can review any of those content updates. So like I mentioned, you can click on these release notes and then inside the release notes, you can actually go in there and subscribe to the content updates. And I get these in my email all the time. So anytime there's new release information as to something going on, you can go through and monitor those emails and, and take a look at them. Again, right now, if we look at this one, they have it set up to download these only, and then you would have to manually go in and review the policies, the apps that changed, and manually click install when you're ready for that. 
When you click on review apps, this is gonna tell you all the different apps that are in that version. If you click on one specifically, like this one here is Apple TV, we can see exactly what ports, what it depends on, what it implicitly uses, um, any action that we currently have for uh, drop resets, et cetera. And then you can look at these characteristics on through. You can also identify their risk level, which you can see down here at the bottom. It will set up a category, subcategories, and even the risk number that you wanna take. All of these are things that we can filter on later. Uh, if we click review policies, this will show you the policies based on your system that this would affect. So for example, if I have something set up like uh, Microsoft Azure or something like that, I can filter out and specifically see what rules that's going to affect. That is app ID. So again, the whole goal is to get away from the old school port based stuff and get into app ID where we can specifically identify the type of traffic that's going through there. But a lot of times when setting up a new corporate network, you know the rough numbers, port numbers that you want, you set up a rule that allows that, you monitor that traffic for a little while, find out the applications that are heavily used. Um, at that point, you can set up rules to allow those specific applications. You may find things like Facebook that you don't want to allow, and that you're finding a lot of your people are hitting Facebook. You can go ahead and deny that, and you can still log that traffic so that you can still go out and find out who's trying to go to Facebook, that kind of thing. All right. Anybody have any questions here online? No. So I encourage you to go out uh, this week's lab. You're going to go ahead and set up um, application IDs and, and policies as opposed to the port-based ones that we did in the past. Um, really play with it, you know, take time to schedule your a little bit of extra lab time um, because it is a wide open lab environment with real internet, test it with your policies and see if you can get familiar with it. I assure you, the more time that you spend in here and truly understand how that stuff works, the better off you'll be for the skills assessment, but also if you guys plan to take the cert. We are going to go through that on uh, Thursday. We'll go do the lab this week. So I won't record it for you guys online, but we will. Uh, I will have the WebEx all open or WebEx Zoom open, um, so you guys can follow along if you want to do that lab together. We will probably go off script at some point and kind of really point out because I feel like that's where the real power of it is, especially if you go out and look at the updates that are in there. So the lab's going to show you one thing, but if you out and you can actually do the Palo Alto updates as of today and see what changed within the applications. And we'll do that in the lab. All right. 